Good morning. Good morning. Shall we read together the prayer for illumination on page two in your order of worship? Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Today, God's word is from his book, Ecclesiastes, book chapter 5, verses 8 to 13. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <coughs> Thank you, Christina. Friends, good, um, I, I haven't said good morning to you all. Eh? Okay, good morning, church. <laughs> okay, uh, we are continuing again in our series of Do or Die series. Uh, the, you can see the series, the, the whole series is in the bulletin in your insert. Uh, we have explained the whole series, what it's about, and we have taken a break. We have, to, we have had a break from this series for the last two weeks. And so now we are getting back into that series again. And this series is basically based on our disciples' pledge. What we as a church have set aside, nine things as a church, we want every member to be applying in their own lives. And so we came up with a disciples' pledge that, you know, as long as I'm a, uh, a disciple of Jesus Christ in this community of faith, we want to do these nine things. And so, take out your sermon notes with me. Here are your sermon notes. At the back of it is the disciples' pledge. And like I say, for the next, as we continue this series, every time when we do this series, we will recite this pledge together. So let's all stand to our feet as one family as in, uh, with our loud, strong and convicted Wesley Malacan voice. Let's recite this disciples' pledge together. Therefore, as Jesus Christ's disciples in Wesley Methodist Church, Malacca, we aspire to commit ourselves to attend corporate worship weekly, cultivate a consistent quiet time, participate in a discipleship group, serve in at least one church ministry, and to participate in outreach, to tithe faithfully and give cheerfully, generously, and systematically, to share our faith habitually and intentionally, to grow deeper in knowledge of God, to glow increasingly in outward holiness, to bear fruit progressively in inward holiness. And may God help us to do what we have pledged to do. Please be seated. <coughs> okay, friends, as you say, we are continuing in our series, uh, Do or Die. And today we're going to talk... Uh, uh, about, um, about the, the, the third topic, about, you know, that we don't have to be alone in our spiritual walk. But before that, let us have a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor and all the glory. And Lord, this morning we ask for your spirit to come and speak to us, Lord. For you to come and minister to us. Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to hear from you. Lord, may you do, may, may, may the words not just pass through us, but may your words pass through our heads and enter into our hearts and produce works through our hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You know, a couple of years back, I brought my children to a I think it was Genting Highlands, if I'm not mistaken. They had those theme park outside there, you know, those theme park. 
and uh, not the casino, all right, the theme park, the children's theme park, all right. And so we went there, and my girl, you know, when, when she got there, you know, there's a theme park, there's a lot of things, and usually the main attraction in the theme park is what? The roller coaster, right? That's the main attraction. And there are many, many other rides there which are the main attraction. But for some reason, when my girl got there, you know, the first thing she saw was one on one ride where it just, uh, they sit on an aeroplane and they just go round and round and round and round, and that's all. All right? And for some reason, she liked that ride. And so the whole time we were there, we want to ask her to go and try something else. No one, she wants to sit there right again. So she will sit there right, go round and round and round, come down, we'll go back to the queue, line up again, sit there right, round and round and round, come back, go back to the queue, sit there right, round and round and round and round. And she just wouldn't sit anything else except that one ride. And, some, and, then, and, then, and for her, she, in her mind, that's all it is to the theme park. That's all it is, that one ride. Sometimes we're like that, you know. Sometimes, you know, we can do that in our Christian life as well. We can sometimes end up thinking that in our Christian life, there is only one thing. And, that, and, that there's only, and we miss out on what else there are in our Christian lives. You know, we spend 20 years, 30 years part of a church as a community of God. We spend 10, 20, 30 years in church and we miss out the most important thing about being in church. Because many times we think that all there is, is needed to be a Christian is to come to church. We think that all that is, is needed in the Christian life is to come and to worship God together on Sundays. And so we think that all there is to do is just as long as I show up, that's all there is to the church life. That's all there is to our Christian life. And friends, let me tell you, if to you, if church is just about showing up on Sundays to worship and that they're all, that is all there is to you about your Christian life, about church, then you will be very fond of sneaking quietly into the church and sneaking out quietly when the service is over. Because that's all there is to you. Because that's all that church is to you. And for many years of my life, that's what I've been doing. I will sneak into the church, attend the service, do my duty, and I will sneak out because I thought that that's all there is to the Christian faith. But friends, like my daughter who just thinks that the theme park has only one right and miss out on everything else, I have been missing out in our Christian walk for, ma for many, many, many years. And that's what we do, friends. We miss out on, the, on what Christianity or what our church life is all about. And because of that, as a result, we find our lives not, exact, not what the Bible teaches. We find our lives not living up to what the Bible says. We don't see the victory of God over in our lives. We don't see our lives having victory over sin. We don't see the power of God in our lives. And because we've got it wrong, we thought that church is all about coming to worship on Sundays. And so, friends, if that's the case, then what is the purpose of church? Well, may I suggest to you, let's read in Acts 2 verse 41. Let me read. Let's see what church is all about. And this is the early church. This was the first church that, that ever started in the Bible, the first church in the New Testament. And let's see what church was to them. Okay, in Acts 2 41, it says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Overnight, you have a mega church. Overnight, 3,000 souls. That's about 10 times our size. Okay, 3,000 souls. And they continually steadfastly, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You see, friends, the early church experienced a great power of God. Daily, there were people being added to the church. Daily. But why? What is it? What, what did they do? So what, what, what was it that, that, that they discovered which affected the power of God in their lives. Well, let me read, let, let's go back to verse 46. Read carefully verse 46. So continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. You see, the first thing we realize is this, friends, that they were in one accord. The church was one. The church was united. But although they were one, yet they met daily in the temple, like what we are doing now, 
we meet daily in church. I mean, not daily, but weekly. We meet together in the temple, in the house of God to worship God, yes. But not only that, they also went from house to house. That although they were a big group of 3,000 and friends, let me tell you, there's no way in those, in those days, even in today, that any house can fit 3,000 people. All right? But yet, the disciples, they gathered together from house to house. Even though they have gathered together in the temple, yet they gathered together house to house in small groups, in small numbers. They do not fail to meet regularly from day to day, house to house, in small groups. And that's what the early church was about. It was not about a group of people going to the temple and making a loud noise. It was not about a group of people worshipping together in 3,000 people, fill up the temple and worship together. No, the church, early church was about a group of people gathering together in corporate worship as well as in small groups. And so you see, friends, what the early church had was they had a community of faith. Would you write with me the first point in your notes? The essence of church is not Sunday worship. The essence of church is not Sunday worship, but community. Community, friends. That's what church is all about. And that's what the early church realized. They realized that being a Christian, that being in church, being part of a church, is about being in a community. And not just any community, but an authentic community. A community which truly cares. A community which truly watches over one another. A community which truly builds up each other. A community which edifies each other. Where there is pure Christian love. A community which holds each other accountable. Which can only happen when there is genuine relationship within that community. And so friends, let me tell you, for a church to survive, for a church to survive the generations, it must have authentic community. But that's what keeps a church going. You know, it's not the building that keeps a church going. It's not the sound system or the video or the projector or even the pastors that keep the church going. But what keeps a church going is the community, the authentic community that it forms. And you know something about, about authentic community? Something about genuine relationship is this. It doesn't happen in a large setting. It cannot happen in a large group of 3,000 people, 500 people. Authentic community, genuine relationship doesn't get built up in a large setting. And that's why, friends, authentic community doesn't take place in church on Sundays. But authentic community, genuine relationship takes place when we meet from house to house in small groups, in accountable small groups. That's why Acts 46 says, so continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. The early church knew. They knew that authentic communities happens from house to house. And they move they move from the temple to the house, from the house back to the temple again, from the temple to the house. And not only the early church. It's what Jesus did as well. If you look at the ministry and the life of Jesus, you know, Jesus had the 12 disciples with him. He had his 12 disciples. But at the same time, you read the gospel stories, he always had the multitudes following him. The crowd, the huge crowd. You know, when he fed the 5,000, how many were there? 5,000 following him. You know, and he was always, be, and you, if you read, he was always shuffling. He was always shuffling between the community, the multitudes, the crowd, ministering to them. And then he will retreat with the 12 disciples. And after that, he will go back to the multitude and minister to them. And then he will retreat back again with the disciples. And then he will go back to the multitudes and minister to them. And he'll retreat back again to the disciples. And he knew the importance of building genuine relationships. He knew the importance of having an authentic community surround him in small groups. He knew, and that's why his life was a moving forward, back and forth, back and forth between the crowd, between the corporate worship, the corporate body, and a genuine community, a genuine relationship within a small group. It's impossible to experience genuine community in a large group. 
Because you see, when you're in a large group, fellowship is very superficial. You all go in Yamcha after, when you all go to the uh, Ranger Hall and you all have just some bites, you know, the fellowship is very superficial. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. You know, it's a very superficial fellowship. It's not just re- genuine relationship doesn't get built up by saying hello, bye on Sundays. It doesn't. But it only happens in small groups when we commit ourselves to one another, when we commit to spend time together, when we commit to invest our time with one another and sometimes we need to be structured about it because sometimes things don't happen unless we become structured about it and that's why we have formed structures of small groups within our local church you know the devil knows that this you know the devil knows that this is so important the devil knows that once a Christian is in a community it is so much harder for the devil to get him and that's why the devil's favorite lie to many of us is to make us think that we don't need the community to make us think that it is okay to just sneak in the church on Sunday and sneak out after the worship it is okay that you don't need a community that you are well enough on your own you can stand on your own two feet after all faith is between you and God not you and everybody else so it doesn't matter and that's the favorite lie of the enemy because the devil knows the minute he gets you out of a community the minute he gets you alone on your own you are ripe for the picking you are ripe for the picking. You know how does lions hunt preys? How do lions hunt herds of animals, of zebras, or deers, or antelopes? They chase, they scatter the, they scatter the herd, and they pick on the one that is all by itself, the one that is left behind. And the Bible tells us our enemy is like a lion, roaring, prowling around, just waiting to devour us. And he knows that the moment you get left outside, the moment you are out of a community, the moment you are left alone, you are just ripe for the picking. And that's why, friends, we need to be in community. Why is it so dangerous? Well, would you write me the next point in your notes is this. We are not made to be alone. We were never made to be alone. You know, we are relational creatures. Genesis 2.18 says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Of course, later on, this, this immediately refers to husband and wife about Adam and Eve. But it also refers to the larger context that man is not meant to be alone. We are not created to be alone. And we don't function well when we are alone. What do you mean by alone? Webster's Dictionary says alone, defines alone as being separated or isolated from others. Or the other definition is without being without aid or support. And sometimes and we don't function well that way. We don't function well when we are separated or isolated from other people, especially in the community of faith, when we are isolated from the community of faith, we don't function well because we were not made that way. We were wired. We were designed to be in relationship. We were designed to be in community. And when we don't function well, we behave weirdly. We start doing weird things. You know, there's a story told of this, this group of people. They were stuck uh, on a shipwreck and they were floating in sea for many, many years, uh, for many, many days. And even weeks, they were just floating in sea and just barely surviving. And when they were just about to, be, to just give up and jump into the ocean, uh, suddenly, a genie appeared in front of them. And the first guy looked at the genie and said, the genie told them, I will give you all three wishes, one for each of you, since there are three of you. And so the first guy said, Oh, I wish to be home with my family. I miss my children. I miss my wife. I want to be home with my family. And immediately, poof, the guy is back home with his family. Then the second guy said, Oh, genie, I wish I would be back in a nice resort by the beach with all the booze I can and all the girls I have and just enjoying life. And poof, he appeared next in Hawaii enjoying the beach there. And the third guy looked around and said, I'm so lonely, all my friends are gone, I wish that they would come back here right now. <laughs> Loneliness makes us do stupid things. In fact, you know, more, on a more serious note, science, medical science has even classified loneliness as an illness. They have classified chronic loneliness as an illness. And this is what it says in some of the uh, medical journals. It says, the increased mortality risk is comparable to that from smoking. In other words, the illness of loneliness 
that uh, the risk of mortality because of loneliness is the same as that of smoking. And loneliness is about twice as dangerous as obesity. Loneliness is twice as dangerous as obesity. Social isolation impairs immune functions and boosts inflammation, which can lead to arthritis, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. I don't know whether doctors can verify this or not, but this is from some medical journal that I got this. Loneliness is breaking our hearts, but as a culture, we rarely talk about it. Is it even science today? They are ref- they're seeing loneliness as an ailment. You see, friends, because we don't do well when we are alone. We don't function well because we are not made that way. That's why Proverbs 18.1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desires and rages against all wise counsel. You know the story of Adam uh, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, their children? Remember the story? Cain murdered Abel. And when Cain murdered Abel, God appeared to Cain. And God asked Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? And Abel and Cain look at God and says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer to that question is yes. You are your brother's keeper. You are to be in a community. And because of that, God placed a punishment on Cain. And what was the punishment? He's, and, God, and God says to Cain, What have you done? The voice of your brother cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth. He has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be. A fugitive and a vagabond. And Cain's reaction was this. And Cain came to the Lord and said, My punishment is greater than I can bear. You see, friends, when Cain was punished, the most severe punishment that God can place upon Cain for murdering his brother was isolation. Was to be kicked out of the community, was to be a fugitive and a vagabond all alone in his life. That, my friends, was the punishment of God upon his life. That And Cain was saying, that is more than I can bear. Because we humans don't function well when we are alone. We are not created that way. And God God knows that we don't function well outside of an authentic community within a small group. That's why He gave us a community. He gave us a community of faith for us to build relationships with. And that's why Psalm 68 verse 6 says, God sets the lonely in families. He sets the lonely in families in families and in matthew 18 20 it says for where two or three come together in my name there i am with him in other words when the people of god comes together in relationship when they come together and invest their time and their energy together in small groups jesus's promise is i will be there with you because when you have authentic genuine relationship when you have authentic community my blessings are there I will walk with you. I will stand by you. My blessings are there when you come together in authentic community, in genuine relationship. And that's why it's so important to be in authentic community. And that only happens in small groups. And there are many reasons, many advantages of it. But today I'll just address one. And would you write me the next point of your note is when we drift, small groups becomes our anchor. When we drift, small groups become our anchor. You see, Luke 17, 1 says this, and he said to his disciples, Jesus said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks should come, but woe to him through whom they come. In, uh, you see, you know, stumbling blocks, it's, it's impossible that we would not stumble. I mean, we stumble because we didn't see something, correct or not? I mean, you don't stumble over something that you see. If you see something on the road, you're not going to stumble over it. You stumble because you don't see something. And what Jesus is saying here, if you look at what he's saying, is that stumbling blocks will come, that you will stumble, that in your life you will stumble, and it is inevitable. In other words, you have to look at the original Greek language. You see, Greek it doesn't follow our English grammar. They have a weird sense of grammar in the Greek. But one of their rules of grammar is that they will emphasize the what is the most important word, they will say it first. You know, like you watch Star Wars and you hear how Yoda talks, right? Something like that. You know, where the most important word they will say first. And so if I were to give you this verse in literal Greek, it will say this, Impossible it is for stumbling blocks not to come. Impossible it is 
for stumbling blocks not to come. In other words, what Jesus is saying is not that stumbling blocks will come, but what he's saying is it's impossible that it will not come. It is impossible that you will avoid stumbling blocks. It is impossible that you will not see, that you will not experience stumbling blocks. It's impossible. In other words, each and every one of us will go through stumbling blocks one point or another in our lives. Some things will come along our life that will cause us to stray. Something that will come along our way that will cause us to drift. For some of us, it could be when we left college and we go back to a new setting or, we, or to a new lifestyle and we, and we go back home and we realise that, you know, when I was in college, my faith was so strong, but now I'm back here away from college, away from my friends, I find something is just missing and I slowly drift away sometimes you know it could be the friends uh, you hang out with and because you hang out with friends and to them they didn't bother about church to them god was not important whatsoever it's not because you decided that god is not important but because you've been hanging out with them and it seems that god doesn't bother them it, it doesn't matter that they have no community of faith and slowly that's those values rub on into you and you begin to realize your heart also drift because you mix with this crowd of people that, does, that, has, that, that, that has no value in God. Sometimes we begin to earn a little bit more and life begins to get comfortable. And as things get more comfortable, we begin to enjoy more certain things and we begin to fear losing certain things and our hearts begin to drift. Sometimes because of difficulties, because of problems that arises in life, calamities that comes in our life, unexpected events that just blindsides us and just knocks us off our feet, and we, our hearts just stumble. We just drift away. And it's what Jesus is saying, you know, that it is impossible that, there, that you will not face stumbling blocks. It's impossible that you will not face stumbling blocks. And no matter how strong you are, there will be things that will come your way that may cause you to stumble. And friends, let me tell you this. If Christianity, if church, if all, church, if, if all that church is to you, is Sunday worship. If all that church is to you is attending worship on Sunday, coming to church on Sunday, if that's all church is to you, let me tell you this, friends. It is very easy to stumble out of attendance. It is very easy to stumble out of Sunday worship. But it is so much harder to stumble out of relationship, to stumble out of a community. Let me say this again. It's so easy to stumble out of an attendance. It is so easy to stumble out of attendance, but it's almost impossible to stumble out of a relationship. I mean, think about it. Now with today's, today's era, you know, you want to get out of a relationship, you want, to, you want to cut off a relationship, it's not easy, you know. You have to what? You have to change your handphone number, you have to change your address, you have to change your Facebook page, you have to change your email address. You know, there's so many things. You just, but if it's just attendance, it's just not showing up. It's so simple. But when you are in a genuine community, a community that holds each other accountable, when stumbling blocks come, when tough things come, it's almost impossible to stumble away. You may drift for a while, but the group will hold you back. The group will hold you accountable because that's what the community, authentic, authentic community is for. A community where we find peace with, where we find affinity with. What about my family? Some of you say, you know, can they be my community? Can they hold me back? Can they keep me on the right path? Let me ask you this question and just think about it honestly in your life. When things are going worse in your life spiritually, when you are furthest away from God, isn't your family the last person you will listen to? Isn't that true? I mean, when you are away from God, the last person you're going to listen to is your father and your mother. When you are drifting away from God, the last person you're going to listen to is your wife and your husband. I mean, I don't know why, but we, are, we humans are like that. We tend not to listen to those closest to us. But in a community that holds us accountable, we sometimes listen. We sometimes heed other voices more than our own family. I'm not saying that's right, but what I'm saying is that that is our human nature. And that's why the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, it says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall one will lift up his companion but listen to the next part of the verse is very important but woe to him who is alone when he falls for he has no one to help him up woe to him woe to the christian who is alone because there's no one 
to help him up when he falls. You know, the greatest tragedy for Christians today is thinking that I'm too busy or I'm too distracted to spend time to build relationships, to build rela- genuine relationships in a community. That's, that's the most tragic thing because when they fall, when they stumble and it's bound to happen, there is no one there to pick him up. When you have authentic community, they serve as an anchor. No matter how far you drift, but there's still an anchor that will pull you back. You know, there's a story, I was in a conference once, and I heard a, a story of a church, a true story. I just can't remember the name of the church. But in this church, they were about a 500-strong church, slightly bigger than us. And in this church, they realized they were doing a lot of things. They were winning a lot of souls. But their numbers never grew because they were, having, they were, they were also losing a lot of people whom they have converted. And so they began to do a study. And the senior pastor realized something has to be done. We cannot keep losing people. We win a lot, but we keep losing people. And so he gathered 12 of the most recently baptized members of the church. He invited them to his house for dinner. They were all new Christians. And they were very excited to be invited to the pastor's house as new Christians. And after supper, he sat them down. And he asked them, do you want to know what's your future holds? in this church as it is now, what your future will be? They said, yes. So he said, based on statistics, in the next two or three years, two of your marriages will have broken up. And because your marriage has broken up, the shame will cause you to leave church. Three of you will have a conflict with someone in the church and you will leave the church because of that. One of you will have a tragedy and lose your faith and leave. Two of you will have a moral failure and leave. And two of you will lose interest and drift away. In two to three years, out of this whole group of 12, only two of you will be attending church and only one of you will be at this church. That was the statistics of the church at that time. There was a dead silence. All of them said, surely it won't happen to me. Like what Peter said to Jesus, Surely, Lord, I will never deny you. And the pastor says, they say, What can we do? And the pastor says, I want 12 of you to gather together as an accountability group, to meet together regularly, to invest in relationship, and to build a community among you, an accountable community. As a result of that, that's what they did. These total strangers formed a group supported each other through tragedies, through divorces, through conflicts, through moral failings. And after many, many years, more than the two to three years, only one person left, was lost his faith. But the other 11 stayed whole together. And this church went from losing 10 out of every 12 converts to losing only one out of every 12 converts. That's what authentic community does. Authentic community based on genuine relationships. It holds us together through thick, through difficulties, through moral failings, through spiritual wilderness. It holds us together. Well, I just want to bring us, that brings me to my final point. Start by intentionally getting involved in small groups. Start by intentionally getting involved. You see, friends, we have to be intentional about being involved in communities. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen by chance. You know, just because you attend a church in such a big group, suddenly, automatically, you have communities forming by itself. No, it doesn't happen automatically. And because of that, you know, we have to be intentional about it. We have to be intentional in getting into communities. And if you're already in a community, in a small group, you have to be intentional about making that small group an authentic community with genuine relationship with one another. That's why Proverbs 12, 26 says, the righteous should choose his friends wisely. We need to choose to be in a community. We need to choose to be among friends. We need to be intentional about being part of a community. Some of you say, but pastor, I don't feel the affinity. 
I don't feel the need to be in a community. I don't feel, you know, I don't feel numb with those people. I don't feel I can, I, can, I can adapt with them. I can sit with them. I can enjoy this community. I just don't feel like it. I'm, you know, I'm an introvert. I like to be alone. You know, you know I find strength. Friends, let me tell you this, okay? I'm an introvert. I am a real introvert. And I find strength. I find joy when I'm alone. I find refreshment, energy when I'm alone. When I'm in a crowd, I exhaust energy. That's why after every Sunday after service, I'm exhausted because I exhaust energy when I'm in the crowd. And so some of you, you're like that. You know, we just like to be alone. We like the solitude. We like the peace and quiet. Let me tell you this. This is a term used by uh, Pastor Andy Stanley. He used this term called structured relationship. What is a structured relationship? It's basically this. It's a relationship you move into not for the sake of the relationship, but for the sake of the progress you can make as a result of the relationship. Structured relationships is a relationship that you get entered into, not because of the relationship, but because of the progress that you can make as a result of that relationship. And we do it all the time without realizing it. We do it all the time. Like for example, when you get a promotion or you're applying for a job, and you get, into a, you get a job, and you get, when you get a job, you're actually thrown into a community, correct? A group of people. And you don't, you, you don't go for a job interview and you tell the, the employer, okay, uh, you give me two months first, let me try out and see whether I like the people I'm working with or not. And if I'm comfortable with them, then I will accept the job. We don't do that, right? Why? Because we enter the job because we want to earn an income, we want money. We, and that's why we enter into the job. And we enter into that relationship and somehow we find a way to navigate around it. Somehow we find a way to, 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 to find people we like and some people we don't like. And after a few years, the people we like, we don't like. And the people we don't like, we begin to like. And we just navigate around it and we, we, we survive in the community, in the relationship. Likewise, you know, parents, when you send your children to tuition, you don't go and say, okay, child, you go and attend tuition first. After one week, one month, you tell me whether you like your friends in the tuition class or not. You don't like them, then might we change another tuition. We don't do that. We send them there, you like it or not, you make friends with those people. And because of a progress, because of the gain that you will get from attending that tuition class. When we apply for college, you know, we don't look and see, do I, do I like my classmates? Do I have good classmates to attend with? I apply because I want a course, I want to, a degree, I want to get something. And when I'm in that relationship, I work my way around it. I deal with it and I adapt to that relationships. Likewise, friends, you know, because, you know, you enter into relationships because, because of pay, because of promotion, because of career, and you're willing to bear with those relationships. You're willing to adapt yourself to function within that relationship for the sake of progress. Likewise, in your Christian walk, if you want to grow, beyond what God has intended for you. You need to intentionally get into communities, into structured relationship. In some cases, it may be a forced relationship, but just for temporarily. But as you build genuine relationships, that community can become an authentic community for you. And, you know, most people when they come to church, their stories will be, I used to come to church, but after a while, I don't come to church anymore. Why? Because there was a community, there was no community that holds, holds us back. And you can't remain anonymous in church anymore. And it's almost every Christian that I know who is growing in their faith or growing in their walk with God, they undoubtedly always have a community behind them. Whether it be a small group, a Bible study group, a, a group of friends that meet regularly to uphold them, somehow they always have a community behind them. May I encourage you this morning, friends, to be intentional for the sake of your spiritual growth. Get involved in structured relationships. Get involved in communities, in small groups. And for that, we have a list. If you look in your bulletin this morning, there is this purple color list here, the purple sheet. We have listed out all the small groups, the disciple groups that we have in our church. And right now, we have about 15, and we're going to start another one no, no, 16. We're going, I'm going to start another one. And so we have about 15 groups all together now. Friends, may I encourage you, look through this list. Find a group that you can adapt, that, that you are comfortable with. Find a group that is convenient for you and enter into that group. Intentionally get involved in that group. But pastor, 
I really to try lah. I look through all this group ah, and I really find nobody there that I can start hand with lah. Then you know what I encourage you? Form your own group. Get a group. Get a, get ten friends, five friends in church where you don't know each other, where where you 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 are not in a group together. Get a whole of a bunch of you. You gather together. You start a group. And if you and if you are not willing to lead the group, don't worry. We will just host the group. We will provide a leader for you. If you are willing to lead the group, then by all means, we will train you. We will guide you. We will walk with you. But whatever it is, either you start your own group, you start a new group, or you join the existing group. Whatever it is, bottom line, friends, get involved. Get intentionally get involved in a group. Get involved in an authentic and genuine community. Community, because you need it. You need it. I just want to close with these two story. A young Christian got fed up with church, and he decided not to go to church anymore. He decided to cut himself off from church. A wise pastor went up to him, went to visit him in his cabin. It was winter that time, and without saying a word, the pastor just sat with him in front of the fireplace. The young Christian thought he was going to get a whole lecture about not attending church. The pastor just sat there quietly, looking at the fireplace with the fire burning. He went forward, he took the tongs, and he picked up a hot burning coal from the fireplace, and he placed that coal on the floor, away from the fire. At first, the coal was red; it was burning red. But after a while, it got lighter and lighter, and all that remained is just a black piece of stone. The pastor then picked up that tong, picked up that coal, and put it back into the fire. And one in a short while, that coal began burning, began glowing red once again. Without saying a word, the pastor left. That young Christian got the message. You know, likewise in my own life. You know, when I was when I went to college, university, I didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity at that time. I didn't want to have anything to do with church at that time. I even tell, told myself, "Yay, Medica, I can get out. I can I can stop going to church because I, I'm away from home." And that's what will happen to many of our young children. That's why parents be careful. But it's what I went through. And when I was there in college, university, there was a group of Christians. For somehow, by accident or what, I still can't remember what the details. I got part, involved in part of that group of Christians, but I didn't, and I was struggling a lot. There was a lot of struggle in me at that time, and I decided, at one point of my time, I decided to just give up, to just leave the, just, just leave this whole Christian rubbish, and just get out. My group leader at that time, he prayed for me. He kept coming, knocking on my door. He kept banging on my door, and I just keep turning him down, over and over and over again. I just didn't want to have anything to do with them anymore. Until he even shared with me at one time, he came to God and said, "God, I also give up on this fellow already. I don't, I you know, I don't know what to do with Andrew anymore, and I just give up on him." And that day, for some reason, because of his persistence, being there with me. To guide me, to drag me all, to, to hold on to me. Eventually, I did come back. Eventually, I did come back to the group. I came back to the faith. I found my faith, and that was the beginning of my life with God. But it all started when there was an authentic community to hold and to walk with us through the most difficult times of our faith. May you, friends, don't be comfortable just sneaking in and out of church on Sundays. Otherwise, you'll be missing what Christianity is all about. But get intentionally, get involved in a community, and your lives will never be the same. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honor, and all glory. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. I just want to pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters right now. For those of them who have been hurt. By communities in the past, for whatever reasons, Lord, I pray that you will do a deeper work in their hearts. You will take away the hurts, the past, and you bring them back to the community. 
for those who have, given, have been giving lots of excuses for not, for not having the need to be in a community, Lord, I pray that you convict their hearts. You help them realize that, there is, that church is all about communities. And for those who are already in communities, Lord, I pray that their communities will grow even stronger, that their relationship will become even more genuine, that the community will, community will be an authentic Christian community, a community that will be an example of true Christian love. Lord, I just commit each and every one of my brothers and sisters unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.